morning, Mike Ritzema and Tim Nass here with I3 Business Solutions, Grace running the live event. And we're gonna talk about Microsoft Teams for home office work. It's our coronavirus edition, week four. We're gonna get into mobile apps. We're gonna get into the admin center and we're gonna get into best practices and etiquette. And let's just pause a minute and, and just refresh that, uh, you know, mobile, all this cool technology. We love the technology here at I3 Business Solutions, but what are we trying to do? What are the managers, the executives trying to do in the business? And that is be more productive, be more profitable and manage risk. And I'll tell you, uh, with this pandemic in America and in the world, risk management from a financial and a technological standpoint becomes very important. So at I3, we talk about accelerating business results and intelligent information integration, not islands. We want integration of information, not islands. And I always say that the technology is easy, but the people in the process, the changes, some work. We're gonna talk more about that today. How does Teams and Outlook come together, mobile, et cetera. But again, systems and platforms, not islands. Surfing. Facebook last night in a community group, and there was an inquiry about time tracking, uh, how to do that. And I replied and said, if you're running Office 365, there are options in Office 365s. Look, there are great platforms out there from Apple and Google and Oracle and Microsoft, uh, but we wanna stay in a perfect world in our business for a security standpoint, we wanna stay in a platform or a system for productivity and for security. So technology marches on, the youth of America, they like their mobile apps, they like their phones. I'm a little more old school. I like my desktop apps, I like my laptop. People work in different ways. And Microsoft is swimming very strongly right now. The Gartner Magic Quadrant, they're in the upper quadrant for unified communications. Forrester, same thing, upper quadrant for ability to execute and for uh, completeness of vision. I mean, Microsoft is really delivering. And then Gartner from a meeting standpoint, same thing, Complete, completeness of vision and ability to execute Microsoft in the highest quadrant. So let's talk about mobile a little bit and give you a little look at Teams right in my cell phone. And let me show if I can uh, see if I can just show you what it looks like here. And that is, you know, on my cell phone, my primary apps shown here and Teams is right in the center of my cell phone. So when I open that up, it's just like the desktop. My goodness, uh, Teams are here and you can see the i3 Teams that we have. And I can click into any of these and get to work. And the same thing with chat. I've got chat here and I can chat, I can format the chat, I can put a subject on the chat, I can at mention in the chat. I mean, the Teams client on the mobile phone or mobile device, very powerful, very strong. And uh, we use voice over IP, we use uh, the phone within Teams. And here I've got my phone system. I can dial a number. I can use the keypad. This driving down the phone, it driving down the road, it rings, runs over cell, runs over Wi-Fi. I want to pause and show you uh, one of the apps that I really love, and it's called Office Lens. So I'm going to go through this a little bit, but. Office, this Office app, Office 365 Office app is your utility app for viewing PowerPoints and Word and PDF and so on. Download that app. And then certainly Office Lens is one I use a lot because I'm old school. I take notes on paper and then I don't want to retype them. I just scan them. And I'll show you how I do that and slide them right into um, either Teams or document folders or our ERP, our PSA system. But I've got OneNote on here so I can find any OneNote that's associated with a team. I've got SharePoint, I've got my OneDrive for my OneDrive documents and, and Word. So all these apps and more are available. 
Well, let's look at office lens. So office lens, you know, I'm done using the scanning machine and walking over there and scanning and then emailing it to myself and then saving it from the email. Let's see how office lens works. And if you've got a document that you're going to send to a customer or a vendor or uh, your bank or somebody like that, you can scan it right in office lens. And I scan that document and I hit done. And out comes this screen here, and I'm going to click two boxes. I want it saved as a PDF, and I want it put in my Office Lens OneDrive. It'll sync. I'll show you that. And But I want to change the name. It puts a default name on there. I want to change that name. And that's what I'm doing right here is I like to use speech, speech to text, so I just hit the uh, speech to text. And I name this Teams Demo Office Lens April 2020. It's going to save to the PDF and the OneDrive. And uh, I just hit the Save button. And this is downright entertaining, I'll tell you. It starts saving it within the cell phone. And uh, there's the Teams Demo document that the entertaining part is within about one to eight seconds, it's saving. And you can see this. The PDF is waiting to transfer, and the uh, JPEG has already synced. So now I'm going to come over to my desktop. So now I'm looking at my File Explorer view on the desktop, where, again, we covered this a few weeks ago. I've got my uh, document libraries from SharePoint, my office uh, business document library from SharePoint. I've got my OneDrive for i3 business solutions. I happen to have a personal OneDrive from an old Hotmail account in Skype. And then I've got my PC uh, uh, files. And that would be the shared drive for i3 business solutions. We still have a shared drive here at i3 business solutions. So those are the you know, four areas I could find them. And let's go to the next. And in OneDrive, when you load Office Lens, by default, you get this Office Lens folder on the desktop and File Explorer. Under your OneDrive for Business is this folder called Office Lens. And when I go to that folder, and again, it's downright entertaining between you know one to eight or 10 seconds, it syncs from my cell phone to my uh, desktop. It works especially well if you're on Wi-Fi. If you're on the same Wi-Fi, it's just instantaneously. Uh, over a cell connection, it might take a little bit longer. But here's my Teams demo uh, for Office Lens and the documents on the desktop. Now, the documents on the desktop, well, kind of. I mean, the PDF is in the cloud, so I have a preview of the JPEG because it is on the desktop. But the one in the cloud's in the cloud, so I'd have to double click on it to bring it down to the desktop. So that's that's Office Lens on a mobile phone and Teams on a mobile phone. Very powerful. Download these apps today, start using them. I'm gonna turn things over to Tim Nass, who's gonna get into some administration training. Tim? All right, thank you, Mike, appreciate it. And uh, thank you everybody for attending uh, today. Uh, give me just a minute. Let me go ahead and share my screen with you guys. And I believe we've got that set. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be, sorry, did you, did you say something, Mike? Nope, go ahead. Okay. Alrighty. Um, so yes, I'm going to go through a little bit of the admin training. And we're going to kind of split it right down the middle. I realize some folks may not ever get into the administration. You'll either allow I3 to, to work on it for you, or you'll uh, have another administrator who'll be doing some of the work. But I think a lot of the places I'm going to touch on this morning are going to be uh, reminders of different settings that you can change, uh, different ways you can roll things out uh, for the users and the rest of it. So first, right off the bat, I just want to make sure that as people start to roll it out, you want to make sure that everybody who's going to be using it already is licensed uh, or has added the service for Teams. So one of the things you definitely want to make sure that you do is go into your users um, in uh, your admin interface on the active users. And if I were to bring someone up here, let's bring, uh, oops, sorry, let's bring up Alec here a minute for a second. And if I bring up 
is the user and we click on licenses. One of the things I'll show you is that uh, by default, these are the licenses that are installed. Usually you're gonna have either a, a business uh, uh, professional um, or one of the E3 or E5 licenses. And in this case, let's see, um, we have, it is the Office 365 E5 license. Um, once these licenses are selected, if you look all the way down to the bottom, there's an option that says exactly how many apps are, sol are selected. You can individually through a license turn something off. So you always want to make sure that you go into those apps and look down the list and make sure that in this case, as we look, there's going to be a Microsoft Teams selected. Uh, often I'll get a call and somebody says, I have a particular user who can't get in at all. This is usually the option, depends on when the settings were done, whether it was already turned on or not. But all right, just to check that. Other than that, uh, Teams itself, the major interface for Teams uh, to work in is one of the admin centers, uh, which will be down here in your list. There's one specifically for Teams, it's called Teams Admin Center. I'll bring this up here a second and run through these. On the dashboard, a couple key spots right here at the top. Um, it'll give you a, a setting, basically telling you what your status is on upgrade. As long as it says it doesn't say anything about not being ready, you should be all set for Teams to run. Um, otherwise, uh, very few, every once in a while, you'll find that it'll show that uh, somebody's not ready. You need to just click through a couple options there. Uh, but on that dashboard as well, we have a couple things that are good to look at is the Teams user activity. Uh, this gives a few different reports that are out there. If we click in on the details for uh, the reports, I can show you in this case, if we do Teams user activity, it is tracing out for us in this case, the last seven days and showing us uh, how much activity we have as far as channel messages, um, which are anything back and forth between different people in the Teams, uh, replies to those messages, uh, posts that have been put in any of those channels, um, myriad of information, and then it also will break it down per user so you can go back in and get other details as well as far as where the activity is. Uh, you can always export this report, which it gives you a little bit more detail and gives you an option to do it, but it's a, it's a good option to be there to kind of see how people are starting to adapt uh, to Teams and starting to use it and kind of letting you know which parts are are not really maybe that active. So indeed. you can get it out. Oh, sorry, indeed. go ahead. Yeah, indeed, Tim, we can see that we're not that active over the weekend here at I3 Business Solutions, right? It is a little bit quiet during that time, yeah, <laughs> which is typical I see with a lot of people. But so, yeah, um, but kind of gives you what the trends are and the rest of it. Uh, so there's three reports that I really like the user activity. There's one that'll give us activity on devices. So we have a good idea of what type of devices folks are using out there. Uh, so in this case, we're a majority Windows. We got some Mac, some iOS devices. Uh, which would be your iPhones and uh, Android devices as well. And then we can break this down and know who's using what type of devices if needed. We also have uh, one more, which is Teams usage. This one's actually breaking down what parts of Teams do people actually use. So we'll show real quick. It's, it's breaking down first, it's breaking down here by each one of the teams to give us an idea of how many, how many users are active in each one of these teams. Um, and then we also gives you a breakdown of how many guests are in that team, uh, active channels, how many messages have been posted. Again, kind of an idea of letting you know if there's some that aren't really actively moving and they haven't moved for quite a while, it might be something where you might wanna look at, you know, removing it, changing it out, or doing something different. Because uh, as we see, uh, if there's too much in there, it just becomes uh, very confusing for people on on where they actually are going to do the communication. So a few reports, and again, you can download those uh, from there anytime. Uh, right, and let's see. I also wanted to show you here on the dashboard, there is plenty of good uh, learning and training material out there. Um, for steps on uh, installing Teams, getting it running, uh, some good training sessions. So definitely take a look at those. So the hard part of Teams, if we get into the Teams, we can actually manage the Teams here. And when I click in on Manage Teams, this is going to give me a full list of, of all the Teams that are available. Uh, so we first start out with a whole overview of the team, how many channels are in there, uh, the number of members, 
and how many people are actually owners as well as the guests, uh, what, what type of team it is, whether it's a public or a private team at this point. Public teams meaning anybody in the in the organization can join that team at any time and can see it. Privates, uh, private teams mean you have to be invited to the team uh, or added to the team in order to be uh, be with it. And then they're either active and we can also archive them at some point if we just don't want them to show up, but we don't necessarily want to get rid of the information at this point. If I were to click in on one of the network teams, it will give me first the option for all the members that we have in each one of those teams, details about them, and then their role. Uh, owners uh, will always have the most permissions. Usually it's if we want to say limit, so who can create new channels. Usually we limit just the creation of new channels just to the owners uh, and members are not allowed to, to add, uh, but they get to see all the content that's out there. And then uh, if I go here, channels, and we look here, it'll give us all the different channels that are out there. The types we nowadays we have standard in private channels. Um, there is the ability now to create a private channel which has a limited whoever you put into that team and then you can add a channel which say may be even uh, uh, a smaller group of administrators that might have a channel in there that you want to keep private from everybody being able to see and we can kind of go through and show you how those are done. Uh, and then we go to just general settings for the channel itself. Um, on the options here, we have uh, it's a question of what you can do on the conversations, allow editing of sent messages. So when you're in the meeting uh, or you're in any of the conversations, you know, there's an option to post a message and then it's a question of whether you give people the ability to go back and edit the messages that they put out there as well as delete the messages. So those are different options that you have going forward. Uh, then there's a few other options for members in there. Uh, team members can add channels or uh, edit existing ones. In this case, we've turned that off. Uh, I can also remove tabs. Tabs are up at the top with the different options in there. So a lot of times, again, we keep the members uh, from having permission to do them uh, by default. When you create a new team, it generally has all these options open to the owners and the members to make changes. If you want to make any changes here, uh, there's an option here up the top to edit. And then it'll bring us another screen that actually gives us the option to change the change the team name. We have the different options. Here are those conversation options here again. Team members can edit sent messages. Team members can delete sent messages. And then the channel features as well that are all turned off at this point for that team. Yeah, and Tim, yes. I imagine I imagine that the editing and deleting of conversations is compliance driven. So depending on the industry and the compliance level, uh, some of that might be tightened down. Yes, absolutely. And again, nothing is uh, completely deleted uh, behind the scenes. We can get to any of the content that has changed uh, with, uh, you know, good logging that's happening in the background. So it's all there. It's just a matter of, you know, whether you give your, your folks the, the option to make those changes and what your policies are. There are a few different policies uh, in different sections of Teams. This is just the standard Teams policies here. Um, what happens here is that every policy that happens, um, every every policy that happens, you'll see that there's always going to be a default or a global uh, setting. Um, so if you don't make any changes, these are always going to be the settings that happen for uh, that part of the policy. So when it comes to the Teams policies in the global, uh, we have simple options here. It's a question of whether uh, other users can discover private Teams. Uh, which means if you make a team private uh, without it being discoverable, it means that another user who isn't a member of that team, uh, when they go into teams, they won't see that there are other private teams they don't belong to. They just they just don't show up at all. So that's an option for them to be able to see them and then decide whether they want uh, to request access to it. Uh, and then there's also an option for whether uh, people can create private channels themselves. Uh, in our case, we have those both of those policies turned on for our users. And um, again, I made another one. There's another team policy here. This one is limiting some of those settings. So if you look here, you can see that it is turned off these options and then 
what I can do is you're actually applying this per user. So if I select this policy, I can say I can manage users and I can add new users here to the list of people who will use this policy over top of the default. So if I were to take the demo user and add them to this policy, that would now override the default policy and use this, this Teams, uh, limited Teams policy for them. Moving next to devices. Uh, some of this gets a little bit more into the voice, which I'm not gonna cover too much of the voice today. Because uh, in the admin center, Teams admin center, you have a lot of the team settings that happen that uh, most everybody's licensed for. There's also cloud voice that happens in here. And then there's a lot of leftover stuff from Skype policies that still apply in some cases, but most of the Skype, Skype for business has now been taken out of here. Uh, but to give you an idea, different phone devices you can set up uh, in the different settings that they have. Uh, we go through here and you can have regular uh, user phones like a, a handset. And um, there's also the option for conference phones. And each one of these would have separate settings. In this case, we've got a polycom here that we can make changes to uh, and set particular policies for those. And then let me go on to, and then Microsoft now has the collaboration bars, which is an interesting item. Um, it's basically a, a conferencing system, mostly geared towards being just a one person. So the idea of being able to create uh, something with a good audio video um, setting where somebody can sit in front of a machine with a nice camera and uh, collaborate with other folks. Um, special settings here for basically when you sit down you can pair it with your uh, username so that your settings transfer through and you can make a conference call with somebody using those options. If I go to locations, um, especially if you do have cloud voice, one of the most important ones in the locations is the emergency address. Uh, by policy, everybody needs to make sure that they have a, a validated uh, business address, something that can be associated with uh, an emergency call and an address that would work for that emergency call uh, for knowing where and understanding where the location is. Um, but also there are some options for when you're reporting, we can go back and we can set reporting labels for if you have more than one location, you can add in IP addresses uh, for your different locations uh, so that all the reporting will show per location. You just simply add in an IP address and, um, and a label for it. Other reporting that I'll show you in a minute would be able to show you uh, and label those properly. Um, if you're talking even larger, there's the option for network topology where we can actually split the network uh, into different subnets so that if you have like a first floor, a second floor, you can actually start to understand where people are contacting uh, each other from, um, which works in diff different ways. Uh, moving forward, if I go into users, one of the key things about the users, uh, especially if you have uh, someone who says that they can't get to Teams or Teams doesn't work, definitely if they don't show up here in Teams users, they are definitely not set up. And that again is where you'd want to go back to the user settings themselves and make sure that they are licensed properly. Uh, but this will list all the users who are available for Teams. Um, if we go in here, each one of them will actually show us their different policies. So let me see, I find myself on this list probably. Yep. And going into each user, it will give me information about them, what my assigned phone number is, type of phone, um, where my business location is. Uh, here is audio conferencing, which again, depending on your license, you either have it or you have to add it. Um, and then the different options we can have with audio conferencing. There's a pin for getting into the administration. All that is edited through here. When we set audio conferencing, there's always a default conferencing toll phone number that uh, people can call to get into the meetings. That information is set up here as well. And I'll just see if there's anything there else. And then um, I said we we're going to touch on the voice too much. We'll pass that one a minute. Uh, but Call history will show all calls that I have made, what their quality is. Now, if it's a Teams call between uh, you know, two users who are using Teams, it's not necessarily 
uh, has to be voice. So you will see all of your, uh, any kind of voice conversations back and forth between users and also conferences uh, that I've been in. So you can also trace back and figure out, you know, what users we've talked to, uh, what type of call it was and whether we had good or bad uh, quality on the, on the phone system. So we can kind of trace back where those issues are coming from. And then, uh, as I said, there's a number of policies out there. Uh, and we just touched on one, which was just that general team policy. Right here on the policies tab shows us the different policies that are applied for me. So you'll see there are ones that'll show uh, like messaging policy. This is a global org wide default policy uh, that's set. Whereas this meeting policy, I have one that's showing a restricted anonymous access. It's how it's been labeled, but there are settings. I can go in here and I can change these if I need to. So if you have different levels, where you don't want people to like say, be able to create a meeting and allow anonymous access to come into that meeting. Uh, these are different policy settings you can set per user or per the whole team. All uh, right, moving on. Um, in meetings, again, here we're gonna go right to the meetings policies. This is an option for the different settings that you can set in here for a meeting. Um, there's a few other special policies have been put in but if i look at the default policy I give you an idea of what we can do now each channel can have the option of doing a meeting and as soon as you do say a meet now on a channel um, it will automatically notify everybody in that channel uh, that a meeting is happening now so it's a question of whether you want that option to be there in some cases as you create channels you may decide that you don't want there to be an option for somebody to be able to just click on a meet now that you should be able to you know organize or schedule a meeting first before you do it on the channels um, again channel and team meetings are are separate and important in the fact that they only allow those people who are already members of the team to be part of that meeting um, there's an option for the Outlook add-in. It's the option for like say when you're in Outlook, if you create a meeting, it will give you the option of whether you want that to be a Teams meeting or not. So the option is right there. Um, and then uh, again, you can schedule a meeting uh, on each channel and also um, allow uh, scheduling of private meetings as well. So your options here for that. And when we're having a meeting, there is an option to create a transcript to the meeting. At this point, it's turned off, but you can have that turned on uh, by default. So it will always create a transcript of the meeting. In some cases, going back to the meeting and looking at it, it's a nice option to be able to kind of skim through uh, how it's automatically picked up what's been said in the conversation. So you can kind of get to the point that you want uh, from that from that meeting. And same thing for recording the meeting and also uh, the video on it as well. And let's see. Again, there are options when you're sharing um, as far as what you can share. Uh, there is an option to limit, say, if people find that it's a problem when they share their entire screen and when they meant to do just a single app, you can change this or you can completely disable the option for people to be able to share their screens or, um, or an actual app when they're in, in the program. Uh, again, we have an option for allowing participants to give or request control. So basically anybody can give that option here. And then it's a question of if you bring in external participants it's a question of whether you you give them the ability to request control during the meetings. Um, and then uh, there are some add-ins for uh, allowing PowerPoint sharing, which works a little bit better. There's an integration with it, uh, the whiteboard, which is another integration, um, and then the option for some shared notes. So with well, the shared notes, it's kind of nice in, in an impromptu mess meeting if you're uh, connecting with people outside of the organization, um, the option to have a, a notes where you can share back and forth uh, part of that meeting and then be able to distribute that to each, each user uh, once you're done with the meeting. And when we go on to participants and guests, uh, this part we got uh, letting the anonymous people start a meeting. Um, usually that's off. It's the idea of, you know, when we set a meeting, we can have an option where either ever ha everybody has to authenticate uh, to the meeting, whether they can be outside folks, and then there's also an option for whether they can be 
uh, anonymous users. Uh, so let's say if the anonymous user were to come into the meeting, one or two of them before the actual presenter of the meeting has started, uh, they could be sitting potentially in the meeting to begin with beforehand um, and discussing this is an option that just kind of keeps them out until you know the moderator of the meeting uh, has started at first. And then uh, here again, this is an option for when dial in users uh, connect to the system. It's not easy to tell who they are, uh, so you can decide not to let them into the meeting right away that you uh, gives you an option that when that person calls in, it will give you a message on the screen saying uh, there is somebody sitting in the lobby waiting to uh, enter the meeting and then you can introduce them and bring them into the meeting. Uh, same thing for again, there's the option for allow meet now in private meetings. Uh, we've got that turned on at this option. Oh, I'm sorry about that ring. And then uh, there is an option during the meetings and we've shown it's kind of useful to have, especially in the bigger meetings, is to keep a chat session going with the meeting. Uh, so as you're as somebody's speaking, if there's something that people uh, want to try to interact with on the back end, uh, there's an option for you to be able to do that as well. Mike, any thoughts, questions at the moment? How are we doing on time? We're a little bit over, Tim. Oh, what? all right. Let me uh, let me try to get through a few of the key ones here. When you're setting up the meetings, I uh, want to make sure that uh, when you're in here. Uh, these are the options to kind of tailor it for your your business. So when you create a meeting, you can have a logo for it. Um, and a few of the other options when I preview it, it's the whole idea that when we send out a meeting, we will send out an uh, invitation that shows all the different information as far as the number to dial into, conference ID, um, any local numbers, and then always the join Teams meeting preview as well that's on there. As I go, we're not going to touch on the live event settings at this point. Uh, let me move to. If I go one more time, message policies. I think again, uh, we have a default org setting for here. The different options that people can do. So as the default policy is, you know, can owners delete the messages? Um, can you send? Can you delete something that's already been sent? Can you edit those messages? Um, also the option for reading receipt and whether we even allow uh, chat which w within the messaging policy. So there's an option to turn off chat completely for a user or a group of users. And uh, other options that are in the chat as far as creating like memes or giphys, uh, all of those options can be turned on or off uh, per group. Um, there's a few more here as we go. And let me see, I want to make sure I cover at least a few more of these for you. And in the Teams apps, now one of the things is there's lots of add-ins for Teams. Give you an idea here when I go into manage apps, uh, there are plenty of different apps that you can add things you might be you know, familiar with. Uh, there's Adobe sign. Um, I know like Salesforce is in here, many different add on options. Some of those are coming from Microsoft. Uh, some of them are third parties. They do indicate here at this point. There's like 492 items that are out there. Um, all of these can be turned on or off whether you allow people to um, add these to a, a team. Um, so they have interesting integrations and next week we'll talk about a few of these, the integrations that are in here. Uh, this gives you an idea of all the different apps there. You could specifically right here set one that you want to block. Otherwise we can go down to permission policies and in the permission policies themselves, this is where we say whether uh, whether people can choose to allow all apps. In this case, this will be all any Microsoft or partner apps. And then we also have an option for third party apps, uh, additional apps, whether they can be allowed. And this could be turned off. We can set specific apps that we allow people to. So there's a couple different settings in here. Um, and then also tenant apps, same thing. We can set on whether we're going to allow all of them or just specific ones or block all together. And let me do uh, one more. Let me get back into the org wide settings. 
this one is a lot of times if you first get in and you you try to add guests to the system and it doesn't allow you to under org wide settings we have settings for external access so here is where we actually set whether we can communicate with uh, Skype, uh, Skype for Business or other Teams users. So that's going to be teams outside of our organization. And then also, um, you know, can we communicate with uh, standard Skype uh, users as well out there? This option down here for add domain is the option to either add domains that you specifically are going to allow you to communicate with on an external basis or ones that you're going to block. Um, that option right there gives you both options. You either set it to block specific ones or you set it to allow particular ones and then everything else would be would be blocked. Uh, but there's an option there. Say, for instance, if you got some competitors or anybody else, you want to make sure that there were never any communications between you and them uh, going in teams that that can be done there as well, along with uh, this is the guest access option and this is about allowing uh, allowing guest access into teams and then the different options that guests can use whether they can also make phone calls once they're a guest uh, and then what they're allowed to do for the meetings and for the messaging and so much to show in such a short time real quick on the team settings just make sure uh, there's some options to if you've got a decent number of teams, uh, there are notifications that happen. Um, you can either set it specifically for the activities you want the feed to be updated with. You can also set teams to allow it to find uh, find particular notifications it thinks that would be important for you to know uh, as you go through that list. And I think other than we'll make sure that we hit on this one here, email integration. Email integration, important about it is that um, each channel can have the option to have an email address that's associated to it so that users uh, or even outside people can email that channel and it comes into the notification area. Uh, you can turn that off. Um, and then also some of the integrations, there are integrations to Citrix files, Dropbox, and Google Drive. All of these can be turned on at this point. We turn all those off mostly for a security uh security thought and at that i think i will let mike let you take over so i don't take all of the time up today very very good tim substantial and expansive wow but i think a lot of what we're seeing here is uh to allow is security around microsoft office 365 and especially teams right that Absolutely. especially if you're in the securities and exchange uh, business, if you're in a compliance driven industry, this thing can be tightened down so you can't share your screen. There's things you uh, that will not be permitted that'll meet the requirements of government securities, et cetera, correct? Mm -hmm. And then I think two things from a security standpoint, best practice, relative to Office 365 and Teams. Number one, if you're an admin, then you must use two-factor authentication. That's best practice number one. And best practice number two is in a perfect world, if you're an admin for Office 365 or Teams, then you have a separate login. So your everyday login in a perfect world is not your administration login. Correct, Tim? I'm sorry, say that again. I was looking at the Q and A's when you just said the last part. All right, yeah, and that is uh, number one, two-factor authentication for any administrator. Yes, but number absolutely. two, mm -hmm. number two is in a perfect world, uh, administrators have a separate admin login, so their everyday email uh, address, if it's compromised as an admin, uh, the, uh, it's the organization is not compromised. Yes, correct? sorry, very much uh, preferable to have a separate user uh, on the system uh, that's just for administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that that everyday user is definitely not uh, used for administration at this point. Indeed. All right. So coming down the home stretch here, we're down to uh, five minutes. Uh, let's just talk about etiquette for just a minute. 
And I'm going to go through a few of these things. Number one, I3, I mean, I think a lot of us are new to the Slack, the Zoom, the home office, the sharing, I mean, chat, it's all, it's all dialing up. But from an etiquette standpoint, you know, I3, we're not perfect here, we're learning this. But manage expectations on when to reply, because we've gone from email uh, and, you know, waiting for a reply to email to an instant, the ability to instantly communicate. And we, uh, you know, do we want instant replies? And we hear it at, at I3, we hear that some users are getting pulled into three, five chats at a time and it's a bit overwhelming and it can wear you out too. So managing those expectations and putting that governance guidelines in place. Number two, if you want somebody to reply, uh, use the app mention. So the app mention notifies them, it bolds it in their activities. It, uh, depending on their settings, will pop up a message. But if you're specifically looking for action, use an app mention. And then certainly fewer messages equal fewer notifications. So we're back to moderating how we're using uh, Teams and email and phone calls, et cetera. Use the do not disturb feature. And that is in your team settings, and we showed it a couple of weeks ago in the upper right, you can set to do not disturb. Now you can focus and get work done. Things aren't popping up and so on. And people know you're not available. I want to show Outlook here also. One of the tips or tricks that I use with Outlook, you can add a work offline uh, setting in Outlook. It's, it's you just reach into your, uh, quick access toolbar, find the work offline, and you can go offline in, in, in Outlook and focus and get some work done. I don't want any emails coming in right now. I'm going to spend an hour and get this project done. So between Teams and Outlook, you can use Do Not Disturb and put yourself in focus mode and then pop up an hour later and say, okay, who needs answers from me? And so reply, use the reply feature in a thread. And sometimes, uh, and Teams isn't perfect, but rather than creating a new uh, thread in the channel or in the team or even in the chat, uh, use the reply feature. Um, this is pretty standard at I3. We want all teams to be public. And uh, that is anybody can join the sales team, the project team, the service team. Um, we're not hiding things here at I3 Business Solutions. So closed teams and private teams should be an exception. I mean, certainly we understand that a finance group or some owner group might be a private channel or a private team, but uh, you know, we're in business here to work together. Let's not uh, have private teams that uh, don't include others in the organization. Use teams and channels, not chats with a whole team individually. I mean, sometimes we create a, a chat that basically includes, you know, the whole or 80% of the network team. Well, let's just put it in a channel or put it in a team and uh, so that uh, it's, it, it can be found in that way. So rather than creating chats with four, six, eight people, Let's use a team or a channel. Uh, you can put meetings in teams. Uh, Tim mentioned this, and it's a way to uh, manage the history of the meeting. So rather than creating a uh, team, uh, creating a meeting, adding a team, and then adding nine people, just put it right into the into the team or into the channel. Become a mute professional. I mean, uh, we're all learning this skill, but when you're not actively participating in uh, a meeting, hit the mute button and take all that static out. Now the professional part is, you know, timing, taking yourself off mute and remembering that you're on mute. And so we're all gonna, we're gonna get there, but use mute when possible in meetings. Use the like button, you know, uh, somebody hits you in a chat or a team and you see it, just acknowledge that you've read it or you've seen it. And rather than having nine replies, okay, got it, that type of thing, just use the like button or an emoji uh, to recognize, acknowledge that you've used it. And then use subject line headers when starting new conversations so that people can uh, come back to that conversation or know what it's about. Teams etiquette. Let's put together some governance, some etiquette. So coming down the home stretch here is 
let's remember that in Teams, in Office 365, in SharePoint, we're moving from hierarchy to, to search. So we're moving from folders and subfolders to search. And uh, that's the way it's built. So we're wrapping this thing up one minute over. I want to thank you for joining us. Any questions, email or call Tim Nass, Mike Ritzma, or Grace Shim. We're here to help. Thanks for joining us. Talk to you next week when we're going to cover planner, shift scheduling, and app add-ins. We'll show you some app add-ins and, and how they work in 